This is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Sean Cole, but the real star today's show is the Next Level Racing Motion Simulator Platform V3. This is the third generation of this motion platform. And this, when you think of motion, this is a very unique motion platform. And we're going to get to some of those features that make it unique in a moment. But what you're looking at is a 62 pound of box of motion that's going to work on the GT Ultimate Next Level Racing Sim or their flight chassis or they make an adapter kit that means it'll work on the R seat. What do you know? I have an R seat. It'll also work on a play seat with a different adapter. Those adapters are $200 each and the motion sim itself, believe it or not, is only $3,000. Now, $3,000, how does Sean say only when it comes to $3,000? Well, $3,000 is very cheap when you consider a full motion seat mover style motion platform. When I say seat mover, there are a few different ways of doing motion. You've got your full rig motion where it moves the entire thing. Pedal, seat, wheel, everything moves as one unit. The other option, which is also very common, you think of a CXC simulation, you think of a sim experience, they're called seat movers, or at least that's what I call them. And it moves the seat independent of the rest of the rig, meaning the pedals and the wheel and the wheel deck are all fixed in location. So there are differences and there are pros and cons to each one and we'll talk about that just a little bit more when we get further into the show. What can I tell you the main details of this rig though? Now the Motion Simulator Platform V3, it operates on just one USB and one plug into the wall. It works on 110 through 240 volt and it draws 350 watts. So it is an extra power drain on your power supply of the room that you have your simulator in. It runs on an electromagnetic type motor that completely locks out when not moving and it'll accommodate a driver up to 130 kilograms or 285 pounds. It's compatible with almost all of our favorite sims and it's made in Europe. And as I mentioned, this is built by Next Level Racing and it will fit directly onto, I mean, it's built to go onto the GT Ultimate or the Flight Sim chassis. As I mentioned, the other option are the play seat and R seat with the adapters. But if you think about it, this is actually the ultimate DIY simulator kit. It's very small, it's very compact, and it is affordable. It also doesn't increase the overall footprint one bit. This whole thing fits directly under the seat. Now it does change dimension slightly, and I'll cover that when we get to that aspect of the show. Now I had mentioned the difference between types of simulation, whether it's a full rig moving or a seat mover. When I think of a full rig on the high end, you have something like the Cruden, $250,000 giant six actuator holding the whole rig up into the air and it has in its pros and its cons. It is very nice to have everything moving as one unit because you can think in your, when you're in a race car, you're strapped in and the seat and the wheel, that's the dimension of the car. In a seat mover, those dimensions are always changing. The other thing is despite a track being very bumpy, the bumpiness is the seat, the pedals, everything. When you have the distraction of bumps while driving, it is all at least happening together. In a seat mover, that bumpiness is moving the chair, but not your feet. Your feet are now being moved by the chair as they try to operate the pedals. So the advantage to the full platform moving sim is that you have that unison, everything moves together. The downside, however, is when you move everything together, it takes a lot longer and a lot more movement to get the feeling of movement compared to how quickly a seat mover moves. The other thing is despite that dimension between the seat and the wheel moving, it also increases that feeling of G-forces to an extent, and that is the point of a motion simulator. The Next Level Racing Motion Simulator Platform V3 also has VR integration. It uses VR headway, which uses advanced mathematic formulas to calculate necessary compensation and it applies it to the VR headset at runtime, meaning the most authentic and immersive simulation experience. Now I didn't get a chance to test it with VR because I didn't have a VR unit here. And I think for most sim racers, their primary focus is how does it work? Maybe when I get a VR unit, we'll do a secondary test on this thing just in VR and test that on its own merits because it is gonna completely change the way the sim drives. Now what's included in the box? The motion platform itself, a USB cable, an extra long power cable, side rails, 
Now I also acquired the R-seat adapter again for $200 and it replaces the stock side rails which actually looked very cool. So I like the original ones better than the upgraded ones but it did allow the use on my R-seat. So before we get down to how this thing actually operates, let's talk about what it looks like, at least when you pull it out of the box. Now I just have the box here because it's mounted on my rig. I wasn't pulling that thing off my rig to put it up here on the table. I have great photos, great video of you seeing it up close, but I just have the box here. It is 55 pounds, so it is rather heavy. And if you have a rig, a DIY rig in particular, it's gonna have to accommodate an extra 55 pounds of weight. Now to give you an idea of the overall dimensions, and this would change depending on where and how you're using it, but for my installation, it ended up being about 15 inches front to back, 18 inches left to right, and about 10 inches up and down to the point where it mounts to the seat. If you're in a DIY scenario, you're gonna need those same seat mount locations on the side, the four points on the side, just like an R seat, just like a lot of driving seats out there, but it is a particular mounting location. Now how does this crazy thing work? It's a full motion platform and it's only this big. How does it do it? It's got two levers, one on each side in front of the seat. Along with that, it has a tension spring that is gonna offer resistance and retraction and smooth out the movements. Each of these levers is attached to the front of the seat on each side, a left and a right. In addition to that, you have a pivot point directly underneath the seat that allows the, the seat to swing left and right, front to back, or any direction in between. Now when those levers operate, they move up and down. If the right lever goes up, it's going to turn the seat to the left-hand side. If it comes down and the left one starts to come up, it's gonna go to center, it's gonna cross over, and it's gonna tilt the other direction. Same thing on the front and back, but they work in unison. Instead of left and right operating like this, when they both come up, it's gonna tilt the seat back, when they both retract, it's gonna bring it back to center, and when under braking, it's gonna tilt forward again. And then you have the ability to do any of the movements in conjunction with the other, and that's how you get the full effect of the, all of the different directions of the car's forces. So now it gets down to the fun part, and that's installing it on the rig, which I, I gotta tell you, I'll admit, I was a little afraid. 55 pounds, I'm all alone, how am I gonna put it on the rig? Now first, I have to take a few things off of my R seat, because that's the variation that I'm doing. So I took the seat off the rig. I took the R seat rails off the rig. I then installed the next level racing side rails in their place, and then somehow tried to balance the 55 pound beast while installing it onto the side rails. All I had to do was put a box or a pillow or something to support it, and I was able to get it in place, bolt it into the side rails, and then reinstall my seat onto the supplied R-seat adapters. I then plugged in the power, plugged in the USB, downloaded their software, and it immediately updated the software update the firmware, which was all fairly automated, and the next thing you knew, we were up and running. Now before we get down to driving and dealing with the user interface or the software that comes with the next level racing motion platform, motion simulator platform V3, I wanna mention one thing. In doing this, it did raise the seat height on my R seat by four inches. If you add this or accommodate this into a DIY rig, you're gonna need to look at the adapter you're using, you're gonna look at their diagrams to figure out exactly how much it's gonna change your seating position. But in my case, I'm dealing with a fixed rig. This is a rig made out of metal. I can't redo anything. I actually had to make an adapter to go on my pedals and raise the pedals up an additional four inches. So that took a little bit of ingenuity or I'd completely changed the geometry of the already two upright R-seat RS1. I love that rig, but if there's one area that I would improve it, I would probably flatten it out and recline it a little bit more. This didn't help in that area until I adapted my pedals and got them back to the same geometry it had stock. On the wheel deck, I had to extend that wheel deck all the way up as high as the R seat would allow. And in some cases, it was still gonna leave the wheel lower and maybe even further away at this point than it used to be. I used a couple of sticks of aluminum 8020 profile, which not everybody has around, but I could have used wood to do the same thing. And I made a little 
extra adapter that raised it an additional inch. In the end, I got the wheel exactly where I wanted, but it did take some working. Four inches is a big gap to fill, and it's a big difference, and you might want to consider that if you're considering this onto your existing rig or any DIY build. In addition to the wheel, the pedals, anything else that really is in a fixed location that you depend on, like my monitors also needed to be raised four inches. So again, take that into consideration before you get going on a project like this. Now, when it comes to a motion simulator, this is not the kind of product that you can just assume you just turn it on and everything works automatically. It is the next level of equipment and it does require you to deal with the user interface to make it operate. But I will say, the next level motion platform so software is some of the easiest software that I've ever dealt with. It's very intuitive, it's very laid out, it's laid out in a very nice way that allows you to navigate it easily and figure out the settings without having to be a genius. The software has pre-built profiles with starting points for just about every game under the sun. Almost every sim and flight sim and even a few roller coasters and other things thrown in. Each profile can be tuned to get the settings exactly right for each sim that you're using it on. The forces that are tailorable or adjustable are the overall intensity, bumps, roll left to right, heave up and down, surge front to back, and sway. You can also adjust the weight transfer bias, rev limiter threshold, and wheel lock intensity. So it only took me a few minutes to really get comfortable with the software. Like I said, they had the starter profiles for all of them, and you could then tailor the settings. And you could even clone those profiles in order to start a second setting. So for example, you do a lot of oval racing, you want your oval settings. You do a lot of road racing, you want your road settings. You could do that for each and every sim. It all uses cool pictures, it's quick, it's easy, and it shouldn't even scare off anybody, even if you're only medium level computer tech level. So at this point, you know all the details about it. I mean, we don't know all the inner workings inside of it. We just know how it works and what it does and how it feels. You know what it costs. You know what it takes to get it on the rig and get it up and running. So what's it like when you get on track? Now, there are a lot of different philosophies when it comes to motion sims. There's a lot of opinions when it comes to motion sims, and I'll say it's not for everybody. But when you first get in, I'll tell you, it's a distraction. At first, it's so different from what you're accustomed to that it's gonna take a learning curve. It is fun right out of the gate, no doubt about it. The minute you get in, you're like, oh wow, my rig is moving and this is cool. But at the same time, everything's moving. Your level of perfection goes down. For me, I immediately had to start turning down the settings. I had to figure out, and the, this is the great thing about it, you could really dial in the settings that you wanted. So I immediately went to work and thought, okay, how much does the car really dive when I hit on the brake? And I'd make that adjustment, and it was very easy to find it and just dial it down with a little slider. And then I would think, okay, when I'm going left to right through a chicane, how much feeling do I want out of it? How much is realistic to me? And I spent a long time actually getting it dialed in, and long isn't even the right word. I spent the amount of time it took, it wasn't a long time, in order to get them dialed in just right. And at that point, it really started to do something that I've really never even felt. Whenever I've done a motion simulator, let's face it, it's at a trade show, or it's just at a visit to one of the factories and trying it out. You're using their settings. They always have a shock and awe approach when it comes to motion. My philosophy on motion is less is more. You want it to do exactly what your brain thinks. I say it all the time when it comes to force feedback and the same is true about motion. What you perceive is what's right. How much feel you think, how much movement. The car you're driving might be different than another car. I mean, obviously like a Baja truck is gonna do this much rock and roll through a left right. On the flip side, a Formula One car might only be like this. The other is how much feeling do you want for G-forces versus the transfer of weight, so to speak, and the tilt of the car. You gotta balance all these. So I did some singling things out. I'd make one adjustment to the motion the same way I would do with building a setup for a car. That way my brain could process exactly. Like, I don't have to think about this when I'm adjusting this, if that makes any sense. Once I got it dialed in, it started to do some very cool things for me. First of all, 
Just the motion is cool, but it is adding another layer of immersion to sim racing. It's giving you another level of effect and it's giving you another level of control, but it does come at a price and it does come at the whole movement. Movement is taking you away from perfection. When you're going into the corner and you turn right, your body's thrown left. Even if you're belted in, your body is being squeezed left. The simulator does the same thing. Now in a real car, when you're going around a corner, that G-force is sustained from the moment you enter the corner to the moment that you are literally relieving, releasing the wheel and going straight again. In a motion sim, they can only give you that sensation once and then it almost needs to relax that sensation or it leaves you hanging out there is the way I like to feel, talk about it. When it leaves you hanging out there, it feels weird. This retracted very nicely. It was smooth. It wasn't jittery. The other thing is, when you get into wheel lockup, this was the best brake lockup sensation that I've ever gotten from any device, whether it be a shaker pedal on a, on a pedal, whether it be force feedback in a wheel, whether it be a butt kicker screaming at full volume. The best anti-lock brake I've ever felt or warning to me was on this and you would be under braking and you get a jitter and you could immediately release the brake to the point of perfect braking. It actually helped me on braking distances once I got used to the movement on the pedal. It was fun, it was solid, it was faster than I expected, it was quieter than I expected, it was a distraction still. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It is there, it is moving you, and that is different than a static rig. The other thing is, racing is about weight transfer. When you think you're going into a corner and you get on the brakes and you load up the front end of the car, heavy, and then you turn in and you throw the weight to the other side and you're loading that wheel that's now taking so much more weight of the car, the rate in which you do that affects how much all the wheels work together. A motion sim actually gives you the ability not so much to know exactly what the car is doing as much as to, to know when you're overdoing it. Because if you're ever driving and you go into a corner and you left right and you feel that thing just throw you, you probably attacked the corner wrong. You need to smooth out. You need to smooth your braking so that you don't get the chatter. You need to smooth out the acceleration so you don't get just thrown out or get that kicking sensation when the rear end steps out. There are cues that do help you out, but it comes at a price that we're gonna talk about again in my bottom line or final thoughts. I will say it was really enjoyable. The ability to have a motion sim in the same footprint as a standard rig. The RC is not a giant rig. My rig is four inches taller, and that is the only difference before, between the before and after of using this, and that is pretty big compared to other seat movers available. So that pretty much summarizes the way it played out while driving. It also came back to how easy that UI, that user interface, how easy it was to jump in there and make settings. There's a perfect diagram telling you what each direction or force is. It's very easy to move the slider. It's very easy to jump back into the game and feel the effect and be able to get it to where you have it just right. So I think I pretty much told you every angle of the driving aspect of it. And I know it did come down to tuning it and getting it just right, but that was when it was the sweetest point. But in case it wasn't clear, in, in case you don't know my feelings or how, I, I, how it felt to me while I was driving, let me break it down with the good, the not so good, and the bottom line. Starting off with the good, of course, which is for a motion platform, this is very affordable. It's a compact design did not make my rig bigger. Easy to use software. So much fun. Quiet for a motion sim. The best brake lockup feeling I've ever had. Great rev limiter feeling. Great sensation of loss of traction. Ability to recline or adjust the center point. Seat is locked in position and will not move when you push or sit in it. 285 pound weight limit. And it really is a baby big boy sim for only three grand. And now on to the not so good. And the first one is, it is bumpy and jumpy. 
It's going to move you around. It's going to be a little bit of a distraction. It takes you down a level on perfection. Must retrain pedal operation. Draws extra power and raises everything four inches. Added a little flex to my seat. And now onto the bottom line, and I do have a lot to say when it comes to my final thoughts on using a motion platform, because there are so many different ways to look at it. You first have to start with that it does take some getting used to. This is, as I used several times in the review, you heard me say the word distraction. And I don't want to make it like that's a terrible negative thing. It's just such an extreme change from a static rig to any kind of motion whatsoever that you have to at first get over that distraction. You have to absorb this new input that you're dealing with in order to refocus your energy on what you've always known, force feedback in the wheel and whatever kind of pedals that you use. You also have to get over or deal with, and for some people it'll work and for some people it won't. The whole realism factor, like, is it really? It, no, it can't give you G-forces. If you expect a motion sim to give you G-forces, it's impossible. You're, you're not moving quick enough. Nothing's happening. You're just being tilted around. It is giving you this sensation of certain forces. It's giving you a lot of the car's movement as forces, not the actual G-forces. Is that seat of the pants driving? There's some of it in there, but it is the G-forces that play on your inner ear that is that true mechanism when it comes to talking about driving by the seat of your pants. You don't drive by the seat of your pants with force feedback. You react to forces that you've been trained by your brain to understand. The same thing is going on with the motion simulator motion platform. It's not for everybody. I can tell you right now, an alien, a Mitchie Hoyer type, a Rudy Van Buren type, an Atsy Kirkhoff, I can't imagine they're going to be huge fans of motion because I don't think the cues are making up for the accuracy of that single screen G29 simple pedals that are the exact same distance every single time. They're not worried about realism. They're worried about perfection. For me, my sim rig is a symphony. When it's just a wheel on a desk and a monitor, there's nothing fine. There's nothing wrong about that. I love the sound of a good guitar. But when you add the drums or a good rig to that equation, the band just got a lot better. When you add triple screens or VR, some enhanced visuals to go along with that, you just added the the, the piano or the organ or synthesizer to the band. When you add force feedback on a high level, you just added a horn section. It's a symphony. And every time you add another component to the band, it takes the pressure off the other instruments. They don't have to play every single role. So in the case of my rig, I need to get butt kickers running on SimVibe because it would be another piece of the band. It would be that force feedback that now I don't need my force feedback to give me anything in terms of braking effect. I'm depending on this. I don't need my butt kickers to overly do brake effect because I can let them focus on road noise. So it becomes a piece or a member of the band. It's a perfect symphony. It's a perfect addition. But you know what? The police were a three-man band and they were one of the best of all time. I also have to admit, when doing this review, I really had to get over some of my skepticism. I come from lots of hours on a CXE simulator. I know what a $50,000 simulator looks like, feels like, and drives like. I'm thinking, what's this $3,000? It kind of reminds me of the wiper motor DIY motion platforms. And I'm like, oh, it's got to be rickety. It's got to be noisy. It's got to break. Been driving it for over a month. Did a 24-hour race break? No, it's shown no signs of wear or fatigue or anything that makes me doubt its capabilities. It's been smoother and faster than I ever would have imagined. And it is maybe the quietest motion simulator I've ever driven on. Then it comes down to some of the driving aspects, some of the cues that you do get. Like I said, this did make my braking better. When I was in that 24 hour race, every time I went a little too hot on the brakes, I immediately got a sensation from this. I felt it before the wheel. 
and I was able to react and save the tires and get shorter, better braking zones. The same thing on the weight transfer. Like I mentioned, when you're throwing the car around, this thing's telling you you're throwing it too much, smooth it out. When you start to come around a corner and step out, just like that ABS sensation, you get a little jitter, just a little bit of jitter, just enough to know, hey, you're overdoing the throttle on exit. You got the wheel too turned, too much for that much throttle. Take it easy. And it really helps tell you all about it. It's fun, it's informative, and it's one of those things, I don't know if you guys remember it, many, many, many years ago when I first, first tried a butt kicker, one of my famous quotes was, if you turn this thing off, you'd be like, who turned off my sim? Same thing, you get motion, you get dialed into the motion, you get used to those sensations, it's kind of hard to turn it off and feel like your sim is still doing the same job. And then the last thing is an area that I really have to applaud Next Level on what they've done. They have taken something that is normally fairly complicated. Every piece of software I think I've ever used when it came to a motion platform was difficult to use. It was even scary for moderate tech level people. This was easy. It took care of most of the hard work on its own and it wasn't hard to make setting setting changes. It wasn't intimidating and I want to applaud them because that's not easy and somehow they did it and all other companies should take a look at their UI because they really did take something complicated and make it easy. So in the end, I'm going to tell you, this thing's fun. There is no way it's coming off my rig. I, I thought for a long time that maybe I would only use motion sims when it came to like playing around. But in reality, I ran that 24 hour race. In reality, I ran last night's Pocono race against the guys. I ran the SRS series races in motion. And once I got used to it, I was able to match my lap times one to one, but it really, really added to the enjoyment. It added to the band. It made the symphony that much better. So thank you, Next Level Racing, for sending this in. It was a pleasure reviewing this product, and I hope I've told you everything that you want to know about it. This is the Sim Pit. I'm Sean Cole, and I'll see you on the track.